Welcome to Strip Cover Lit, where we squeeze the bigger picture out of literature. I'm Adrian Ford, and we are here for the third in a four-part series as we haunt along Henrik Ibsen's Ghosts. This is the reading for the third act. Next week will be the review. So what happened in this part of the play, This the final act of the play? We open with Regina and Mrs. Alving uh, as they watch the fire through the window and the orphanage is burning down. The prospective orphanage is burning down. Saying the orphanage is burning down sounds a lot worse than this situation truly is at this point. Regina asks if she should take Oswald his hat and Mrs. Alving says, oh my goodness, he doesn't have it. Don't worry, I will go and check on him. Uh, she leaves just in time for Manders to enter. Uh, there's a little bit of conversation, and then Ingstrand himself enters. Uh, and Ingstrand comes with the information that it was, in fact, Manders that started the fire. Uh, which it was a well-placed little nugget that we were to believe that it would have been Ingstrand. So that is interesting, and that is well played on behalf of Ibsen himself. Uh, with uh, he did so with a an extinguished candle wick that he had snubbed out with his fingers, and apparently had not quite gotten there all the way. Um, Manders is understandably distraught, and he fears the tide of public opinion, but he also fears for himself professionally. And there is much gnashing of teeth, there is much wringing of hands, before Ingstrand, Ingstrand, I hate that goddamn name, before Ingstrand stands up and says he will take the fall. And that doesn't take a whole lot of convincing on his part before Manders is willing to do so. And Manders promises him, therefore, that with whatever money is left, after all of the legal uh, goings on and all of the cleanup has happened from the orphanage, after all of that is done, Ingstrand's sailor's home will get uh, pushed through. Uh, he will do his best to fund that project with whatever is left. Uh, there is a bit of conjecture and Oswald returns as Manders and Ingstrand are leaving. He overhears them talking about the sailor's home and asks, what is that all about before they tell him? And he says, it doesn't matter. Uh, everything having to do with my father will burn down, uh, including myself. He is, we are to understand quickly, falling ill. And Mrs. Alving sits down and pulls Regina near as well. She begins to tell them, uh, she begins to tell Oswald about his father and how his father was fallen before she ever knew him. Um, which is, to, and this is, this is the damnedest part of the play to me. She's, even in this sense, she is not able, even at this time, she is not able to just come out and say it. Uh, she tells Regina, or she says to Oswald of Regina, Regina, in fact, had as good a right to this house as my own boy had. This is how the revelation that they are brother and sister, half brother and sister, comes about. Uh, the revelation goes poorly. Regina then asks to leave. She is granted that permission and she goes after Manders. Uh, Oswald expresses lack of feeling for his father after that. Um, it is a bit of a conversation between Mrs. Alving and Oswald, before the revelation comes out that he doesn't really feel anything for the memory of his father because he does not quite remember much about his father. And she flips shit promptly, asking him what she feels about her. And he says, hey, at least I know you. Which is probably not quite the endorsement for which she was hoping. Um, then Oswald talks about the true extent of his disease, and Mrs. Alving is petrified. 
I don't know. I thought that this was communicated properly in the previous act. Uh, perhaps I, uh, perhaps I read too much into it, but I thought that at that point she would have gotten the true extent of his disease, but she did not. Um, and quite to her surprise, he shows her a box of morphia powders. And um, she flips out. She asks for them. He says, no, they will remain with me until the time that I need them. Which is quite the thing to tell her because he must be of the understanding that by the time he needs them, it will not be him who is able to apply them. Um... She then promises to help him if he ever becomes paralyzed with this disease, and they don't know how long he will have. He says, I would quite like to live the rest of the days that I have at some capacity in joy. Um, and she says, or he, he makes her promise to help him if he ever needs the powders applied. I believe this is a form of killing him. Uh, I believe that these powders are probably to the extent that if he ever becomes paralytically syphilitic, I am not sure the terms, incapacitated with the disease as happened with syphilis, she would be able and willing to do that. Uh, he makes her promise that. She says no, but he makes her finally promise. And he says uh, he is only able to make her promise that when he throws Regina back in her face, when he says to her, Regina would have done it, you know. Regina would have done it. Uh, finally, she gives in and agrees. Shortly thereafter, he is quickly losing um, faculty. Uh, and he ends up asking her what time it is. She says it's early morning, soon the sun will rise. Um, and then he is asking for the sun. He says, let me see the sun. And he is quickly, quickly becoming incapacitated. Uh, and the last we hear of him, well, he's asking for the sun simply by saying sun, sun, sun. Which is ironic for the sun to do. And the last we see of Mrs. Alving, she is failing to do as she had promised. She's sort of just freaking out. Um, which is, we, are, we have no reason to have built any more trust in her than to assume that after the close of this text, she is still just freaking out. She... Um, has proven very good at keeping secrets, but very, very bad at taking action. And I think the obvious place to start discussion for this portion of the text is where we begin the whole play. And this is with Mrs. Alving and Manders. Manders had convinced her not to insure the orphanage, because to insure the orphanage would be at the distrust of the will of God. Which leaves us to wonder, is this orphanage burning down the will of God? Is this orphanage burning down being the will of God in judgment of Mr. Alving? Is it? Because it is Mrs. Alving's secret that the orphanage is not insured. And it was Mr. Manders' fault that the building had burned down. That it was the act of the man of God himself that burned the building down. Is, we are left to believe, quite ironic considering how much social good would have come from the building. It was to be an orphanage and a home for wayward sailors. Um, so is this a judgment on Mr. Alving? Is this a judgment on Manders? Is this a judgment on Mrs. Alving, uh, whose idea the entire thing was? 
or is this just the act of an absent God? It is my opinion, through much of the commentary that has been made here, that seems to have been made here to me, perhaps I am misreading Ibsen altogether, um, there is some question about the validity of God, some question about at least the validity of God's judgment, and certainly some questioning as to whether or not the actions of God are always just. This is three plays in to the Ibsen canon. So for me, the interpretation there is secular. That this is not the wrath of God, but it is the act of negligent people. The fault of negligent people. Negligent to ensure the building as well as negligent in disposing uh, that wick from the candle. And maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the bad guy here. But I'm questioning whether or not this entire time Engstrand has been telling the truth. We know that it is he who is often uh, to blame for nearly burning down buildings with his uh, casting aside of used matches. We get that earlier in the text. Manders, when the question is raised, does not seem to remember casting aside that wick. Manders was not present when the bulk of the fire went up. Engstrand was absent from the group that we're seeing as the fire breaks out. We know Engstrand is capable of lying. He's been lying Regina's entire life. I don't know if this is fair, especially because Engstrand seems to be the most stand-up character we've got. And of this most stand-up character we've got, his little shit of a daughter refers to him on page 55 as that horrid carpenter. This is the guy who raised her, never having to, who left her inheritance for her, even though he didn't have to. The image that she has of him has not yet been divorced from the burden of necessity, from the burden of responsibility. He did not have to have anything to do with her. He did not have to be responsible for her. He assumed that responsibility and took up her mother's guilt as well. And then she is present she is present to watch him assume the responsibility and the blame for the orphanage burning down as well. All of them see this. No one's opinion of him really changes. What a hell of a thing. What a hell of a thing. And I think part of this... Um, Part of this is reality not having yet set in, I believe. Uh, it, it always reminds me of Star Wars, as strange as that sounds. I've only seen the very first one that was ever made and the prequels. But that very first one that was ever... But I knew... No, he doesn't... No, I'm questioning myself. Yeah, I saw the very first one ever made, and then the prequels. But I knew, spoiler alert, at some point Darth Vader dies. I've seen that scene. It's pop culture enough, I think most people probably have. But in seeing that scene, in seeing um, not only Darth Vader die, but also the, the main bad guy, I, I don't know his name. 
you understand in watching it, there's only three people there, and two of them died. So the only truth that is going to come out of that is whatever L L Luke says going forward. So how many people that knew about the Darth Vader main bad guy duopoly on power in the universe years after they die are still not of the understanding that those two are gone. There's no cameras there. There's no internet to spread the word. Um, and that's always been one of the interesting things to me about uh, the, the, the Star Wars movies. Um, and in this case, I think that the entire reality of these people's lives being cloistered inside a lie that happened between just a few people, Mrs. Alving, Mr. Alving, and Ingstrand, uh, not to mention Joanna, who is uh, absent just as Mr. Alving is, but essentially, so those two survivors, um, Mr. Alving, or Mrs. Alving and Ingstrand, are the only people who really knew the truth about things opening this play. And all of this play takes place within a single day. So it is interesting it is interesting that they are the only two people for whom life is not being redefined, but they are the two people who probably pay the largest consequences. Ingstrand loses a daughter, even though she didn't seem to like him much to begin with. Uh, Ingstrand is also ousted, right? Um, a bit of a comedy for him at the end is he gets the sailor's home that he wanted, but the sailor's home isn't even for him. Where, while and whereas, Mrs. Alving loses a stepdaughter, loses her son, and is presumably to be estranged from uh, Mr. Manders as well, who was her connection to the to the afterlife, essentially, um, through her religion. So those are all things that, um, yeah, I, I will say that Ingstrand and Mrs. Alving pay the largest consequences. Uh, they are not the characters for whom things are the most different going forward. That, I believe, is just Regina. As Oswald opened the play knowing he was going to die from syphilis. Um, and there's a, there's a quote here on 50... This is rough. Regina, uh, after learning of her true heritage, um, asks to leave... And Mrs. Alving says, are you sure? And Oswald says, you won't even stay for me. Um, and she says, no, indeed, I can't. A poor girl must make some use of her youth. Otherwise, she may easily find herself out in the cold before she knows where she is. And I have got the joy of life in me too, Mrs. Alving. So that's rough. Um... It is rough that it is rough that she is without employ. It is rough that she is coming to the realization that she could have had so much more out of life had her stepmother just accepted her, made her a bastard child. And she would have had much more opportunity as well had that happened. But Mrs. Alving refused to do so. Wanted to keep her close. Wanted to keep eyes on her. Wanted to judge Ingstrand all the while. But refused to give her any semblance of hope. Refused to give her any semblance of her rightful inheritance. Um... It's a hell of a thing. 
Um, talking about inheritance, one of the themes that is the one of the themes that keeps coming up throughout these Ibsen pieces is how we inherit the sins of our fathers, how we inherit the world of our fathers, uh, mothers and fathers, how we are to deal with the prior generation. And shortly after, uh, one line of dialogue after that previous quote I gave, this comes out of Regina's mouth. What's going to happen will happen. If Oswald takes after his father, it is just as likely I take after my mother, I expect. May I ask Mrs. Alving whether Mr. Manders knows this of me? She is, she is afraid she will become a fallen woman, fallen woman, without any real say in the matter. What a terrifying way to look at life. What a terrifying prospectus. Um, to believe that these, to believe that, that your fate is predestined based upon, largely, if you're a girl, your mother, if you're a boy, your father. How terrible that must be, how terrible that must feel when you realize you come to the realization that you are of a fallen woman. That is, that is rough. Um, and is one of the things that we're left to deal with in this play entirely. As Oswald did inherit the disease through lineage. Uh, he was born to be this way, it seems. Um, born to have syphilis, born to die in this miserable and terrifying way. A softening of the brain, as it was called. And we must assume, therefore, that his father died of this as well. So for Oswald to be sitting there, sure to die, and, and, and falling so quickly, falling so quickly, knowing what is coming, knowing what is waiting for him, knowing what is, knowing at what he is at the precipice of, knowing that of which he is at the precipice, however you say that, he knows he's right there. He knows this so well that he's carrying those morphine powders with him. They're not in his study. They're not with his stuff. It's not in his trunk. It's on his person. He knows how far along he is. He knows where he's going, which is ironically the opposite of Regina. Regina has no idea where she's going. She's going after Mr. Manders. She believes some of that money is rightfully hers with which he will be attempting to build the sailor's home. And she does not have, she has a fake father, whereas Oswald has his real mother. <laughs> and it's a hell of a place to leave a play with him sitting and losing faculty so quickly. And Mrs. Alving, again, refusing to take action. Mrs. Alving standing there nearly as paralyzed as is Oswald. So there's certainly something to be taken from that. Um, her fear of action is not simply something that had punished her own children during their lives, but is here punishing her son in his death. Um, and that's a hell of a thing as well. But that is all I have for this part of the discussion on Act 3 of Ghosts by Henrik Ibsen. 
I will be back next week again with the review. If you enjoy this sort of thing, it really helps me out if you hit that like button. Uh, hitting share as well helps me out if you want to share this on some form of social media. And if you were, if you feel so obliged as to help me further, there is, as always, a link to my Patreon to be found in the description below.